Hello everyone, my name is Bedram and I'm a professor in data analytics. Welcome to another episode of Deep Learning. All right, this is module number three, part two. In part one, we covered some of the machine learning fundamentals that we need to rely on them moving forward to the deep learning course. In this part, I'm gonna walk you through the most powerful and successful grade and boosting algorithm namely XGBoost, CatBoost, and LightGBM. So this is not a new slide. We have seen this before when we were setting up our deep learning environment. So here is the results of machine learning tools that was used by the top teams on Kaggle competition. So this is a survey uh, that Kaggle runs every year, and it is very reliable and mostly considered to be a good indicator of where is the, state of the latest state of the industry. So as you can see here, on the right uh, graph, uh, the, the top winning teams have been using uh, Keras, LightGBM, XGBoost, uh, TensorFlow, and of course, PyTorch, TensorFlow. Basically, these are the deep learning uh, platforms, and Scikit-Learn, and et cetera, right? So these are the top tools that the winners in the Kaggle competition have been using. So as you can see, it seems that from 2016 to 2022, the entire machine learning and data science industry has been dominated by these two approaches, deep learning and gradient boosted trees. And specifically, when it comes to working with structured data, you know, the data that you can easily summarize it in a nice table, rows and columns, structured data, still as of today, the boosting trees, they are very powerful and it's really hard to beat them, even using a complex neural networks architecture. Uh, but we know that when it comes to working with unstructured data, however, we have to work with neural networks and using neural networks for image processing <clears throat> and text analysis, it's almost inevitable. All right, so without further ado, let's look into the details of these three models, XGBoost, CatBoost, and LightGBM. All right, in order to deeply understand what is the difference between these three boosting methods, we have to start from the scratch. We have to start by answering four fundamental questions when it comes to decision tree based models. So imagine we have a data set and imagine we have a classification problem. You want to classify if someone is going to default on their credit card or not, right? So this is a target variable and we have a bunch of features, right? Let's say the set of features are, uh, I don't know, income, it can be uh, card balance, it can be age, it can be gender, you name it, right? And many, many more features. Now let's say if you wanna do a classification problem using the decision trees, what are the four fundamental questions that we must answer before deciding which, <clears throat> which boosting trees or which basically decision-based uh, algorithm to choose, right? Question number one is what features and cutoff to start with, right? So, Again, in this example, we want to see if someone is going to default or not. The first thing that we need to answer in this decision tree is that uh, what feature to start with? Should the tree start with the income? Should it start with the balance? How do we decide that? We need to come up with some criteria, right? What features give us, gives us the most information gain? So how do we quantify these things? So that's the first thing. And then where's the cutoff? Let's say I start with income, then where's at what level of income I decide, should I go to the left branch or right branch, right? So that's question number one. The second question is how to split the samples, right? Because there are different ways, different methods for splitting the samples. For example, we can think of, you know, pre-sorted or histogram based. We can think of greedy methods or different method, methods that I'm going to uh, walk you through in the next slides. But basically we have to uh, pick what the splitting uh, method we're going to choose. So that's the second question. The third one, which is also a very important one, is that how do we grow a tree, right? Again, because there are different ways we can grow a tree. We can think of it depth-wise or leaf-wise or a symmetric way to grow a tree. So depending on how we pick different algorithms for growing a tree, we may end up with different uh, boosting methods, right? And finally, the last question is that how to combine these trees, how we ensemble these trees, right? So let's say we come up with a bunch of trees. Do we want to bag them or bootstrap aggregation or do you want to use boosting techniques, right? So these are, in my opinion, the four fundamental questions when it comes to decision tree based models. And depending on how we answer these questions, 
we end up with different models. So in this video, I'm going to walk you through every and each of these questions and say that, okay, now with this information, your model is going to be XGBoost or CatBoost or LightGBM. So fundamentally, that's how these three decision tree based boosting algorithms are different. Let's start with the first question. What features and cutoff to start with? So basically the idea is that which of these features and cutoffs is going to give us the most information gain? You can think of the information gain as minimum purity or maximum purity, right? At the end of the day, if you have a decision tree, you want to make sure that you're splitting your picking the features at each decision node such that you get maximum purity or minimum impurity at the terminal nodes, right? So that's the goal. So in order to do that, basically we are trying to minimize something when deciding what features to start with, right? So what is that something? So the, the answer is, if it is a regression, if, if you're dealing with the uh, regression trees, that something is MSE, mean squared error. And if it is classification, we have different metrics, right? So we have different decision criteria. We can use error rate, we can use uh, entropy or cross entropy, or we can use Gini index. So each of these metrics is going to control how a decision tree decides to split the data and give us the most information gain. Let me give you a very, very simple example on the right hand side graph here. So imagine we have two features, right? We have feature number one, X1, and feature number two, X2, right? And we have you no know, 20 observations, 10 of them are red, 10 of them are blue. So it's, this is very, very naive and simple example, right? But now let's say I have two options. I can, we want to answer the first question. Remember, what feature to start with, where, where to put the split? So look at that. I have X1 and I have X2. Obviously here, you know, this uh, green cutoff is the worst. Maybe it can be one of the worst cutoffs. And the red one is a better one, right? It's maybe in this case is the best cutoff, right? So you answer that, okay, the basically which feature, what feature should I start with, X1 or X2? So most probably your answer is X2, right? So this is the feature to start with. Where to put this split? Should I put this split here or here? Where should I put this? Let me actually use color coded lines. So we're, we're talking about the red one. So should I put the split here or should I put the split here or should I put the split here? How do we decide? So in order for us to decide, we have to go ahead and calculate the, so let's say in this example, we calculate the entropy uh, for each of these cutoffs and then see which one is giving us the minimum cross entropy or IE, the minimum impurity or the maximum purity, right? These are all equivalent terms that we can use. So if we, if we do it this way, so as we can see, this is going to give us, let's look at the accuracy or error rate. This cutoff is going to give us the error rate of zero because the blue ones are all on the top, the red ones are all on the bottom, so this is excellent, right? And this cutoff, it actually is going to give us one of the worst error rates, right? So that's, that's how we answer that question. We need to come up with some decision criteria, depending on if it is regression or classification, this decision criteria is different. So that's one thing. Another thing that I want you to pay attention is that, okay, which one should we use? You know, we have three of them actually for the, for the classification. It is error rate, entropy, and Gini index. So the answer is that we, we rarely use error rate because it is less sensitive to the changes in probabilities. And then the choice is going to be either entropy or Gini index. So look at this graph. This graph is going to show us uh, the impurity index. The smaller the number, the better, because we, again, we want to get the minimum purity. And look at the, the entropy, the scale version versus Gini. So the red one versus the green one. And of course, the blue one is our misclassification error. So which one is more sensitive to changes in probabilism? You see that, for example, we go from here to here. And as you can see, the red one is more sens most sensitive. Then the next one is the green one. The next one is the blue one. So we know that entropy is more sensitive to, the, to these changes. So that's why uh, we prefer entropy and Gini over misclassification. Again, because misclassification error is not uh, that sensitive to those changes, right? So the answer is gonna be either cross entropy or the entropy cross entropy or the Gini index. Now, to, which one is faster? So the Gini index in terms of computation is gonna be slightly faster. Well, well it depends. depends. Sometimes it's gonna be a lot faster. 
But for many structured data that you're not dealing with millions of records of data, then usually it really doesn't matter if you pick entropy or cross -entropy, uh, entropy or gene index. Uh, and you let the uh, algorithm decide, right? You, 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 for example, you can use grid search and uh, use either of these decision criteria and see which one is giving you a better performance in the uh, uh, cross-validation data. All right. All right, now let's answer the second question. How to split the samples? There are different ways to split the samples, and these are the most commonly used ones. Actually, these are the ones that are used in our three boosting algorithms, XGBoost, CatBoost, and LightGBM. So let's get into them one by one. The first one is pre-sorted and histogram based. As the name suggests, this method sorts the data first and create histograms of the values before splitting the trees, right? And this is it's going to be a lot faster, but of course it's going to result in less accurate trees. Let me show you why. So imagine we are looking at our credit card default example, and we decided to start with the most important feature that gives us the highest information gain, which turns to be, for example, uh, our balance, right? And then we have to decide where to put, how, how we are going to split from here, right? So let's say I have, we decided to start with balance, or we are looking into balance, because these things are going to be done simultaneously, right? Uh, picking the picking the most important features and putting the split, it's happened simultaneously. So let's say this is the variable of interest, the account balance, and then we are going to come up with a histogram. Let's say there are going to be some accounts with very high balance. Now, usually it's it's going to be close to normally distributed, may, maybe uh, maybe a little right skewed or left skewed. It doesn't matter. That's not the point. The point is that we sort the data, we look at the histogram, and then we're going to put the cutoffs, depending on how we decide these beans, we're going to put the cutoffs here. So the, the good news is that it's going to be so fast, right? So in this very naive and simple example, we're going to just look into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine split, right? So this is good. But the bad news is that you're not considering every single possible cutoff, right? There are so many other values that you're just simply ignoring. So again, this method has its own pros and cons. Uh, but at the high level, this is how it works. The second one is Gauss. You know, this is the, this is a powerful one, is most widely used. It is a gradient-based one-sided sampling. So let's let's break it down. What do we mean by gradient-based? What do we mean by one-sided? Okay, starting with the gradient-based. This method is going to use gradient information as a measure of the weights of the samples for splitting. So what does it mean? Because remember, imagine you have it data set like this with two features, every single of these samples have their own weights, have their own gradients when it comes to calculating the gradient of a cost function, right? So each of these samples, let's say this sample has its own gradient of the cost function, this sample has its own gradient of the cost function, and these numbers can be smaller or larger, right? So the algorithm works like this. It keeps the instances, the samples with large gradients. So let's say this has a large gradient. It's going to keep them in the split. And while performing random sampling on, this, uh, on the instances with a small gradients, let's say these ones, these ones all here have small gradients, or I don't know, the, probably the ones in the, yeah, the ones at the corner are going to have a smaller gradient. Imagine this is a decision boundary. And the one at the middle, that the algorithm's having a hard time to figuring out the class, it's going to have higher gradients, right? So the idea is that if a sample has high gradients, so it means that there is more room to improve, right? Because high gradient is, is bad, because it means that you are far from the optimal when it comes to the gradient descent algorithm. You remember we discussed these things in the previous video, right? So, but if a sample has a small gradient, this is great news, right? This, it means that this sample has been already well-trained. So maybe this is a classifier, and so these samples are going to have small gradients, and we are going to randomly select some observations from them. And however, the ones that have high gradients, there is more, the algorithm needs to focus on them more, right? So that's the one-sided part. So one-sided means that it's going to focus on, uh, let's say, the ones with the large gradient, and it's randomly sample from the ones with the small gradient. So this is a second method. And the third method is the greedy method, right? So this method selects the best split at each step. So the idea is that uh, it does it without considering the impact on the future split. So this is where the name greedy is coming from. 
right? When you find the best split, you stop there and then you call it a day. That's it. You don't and you don't see what is happening the, down the road in the tree, right? So this, mes uh, this method, and for that reason, this method may not be necessarily optimal, right? So it, sometimes it results in a suboptimal trees, simply because we are ignoring what happens down the road and the algorithm is going to stop verifying the best split at each step, at each uh, splitting node. All right, so that was the answer to question number two, how to split the samples, right? So we already covered what features to start with, how to split the samples. Now let's look into the third question. Now let's answer a third question. How to grow a tree? What is, what is our growing mechanism or algorithm? So there are different ways, depth-wise or level-wise, leaf-wise or symmetric. So starting from the depth-wise. This method repeatedly split the data along the features with the highest information gain which gives us the maximum purity, right? Until a certain maximum depth is reached. So this is a pre-specified number. We say, for example, the depth is equal to two, the depth is equal to three, and etc. right? So this results in a tree with a balanced structure where all the leaf nodes are the same depth, right? So for example, here we say depth is equal to one, we end up with two terminal nodes. Here, depth is equal to two, we end up with four terminal nodes. Depth is equal to three, we end up with eight terminal nodes, and etc. right? So the way that it works is that this process is done repeatedly and at each split, all the features are considered and this feature and split might be different than this feature and split, right? So for example, it can be, I don't know, age greater than 25. This one can be balance less than something, less than, well, I'm just making up numbers, 100, right? So look at that, at each split, we can have different, at each level, at each level, at each depth level, we can have different splits with different features. So th that's a big difference between depth-wise and the symmetric that we're going to investigate <clears throat> later on. Okay, so that was the depth-wise. The second one is leaf-wise. So for the leaf-wise, this algorithm repeatedly split the data along the features with the highest information gain. Again, it, there's no difference at this point because they have to all maximum the purity or minimum the impurity until, so this one, this method is going to do it until all leaf nodes contain only one single class. So it goes all the way down to make sure that the purity is one or impurity is zero. So this results in a tree with highly unbalanced structure, no surprise because we have to go all the way down in one of the, the branches, right? Where some branches are much deeper than the others, right? So here's an example. Again, we can start from somewhere and then we go down and then we decide to go down uh, to the left branch, right? So we, we go even further down, then even further down to make sure that at the end of the day, this is a complete pure class, right? So this is called leaf wise. We go down one path until we make sure that we get to the 100% purity, okay? And as we can see, this is going to be unbalanced. All right, the third one is symmetric. And as the name suggests, you know, this tree is going to, the, the algorithm works by repeatedly splitting the data along the feature with the highest information gain. Again, the, the first two questions that we ask, they're still there. You have to start with the feature that gives you the maximum information gain. You have to put the split and et cetera. This is a third question, which is happening at the same time, right? Well, what method you're using for, the, for growing the tree. So we repeat this until, again, a certain stopping criteria is met. That stopping criteria can be anything from, for example, what is the minimum number of samples per terminal node, right? So that's one stopping criteria. And uh, then this, this method is going to definitely result in a more balanced tree structure uh, compared to the leaf-wise growth, right? And so look at that. We have a tree here. Again, we go one level down. And it's symmetric in a sense that I'm going to tell you what does that symmetric mean. So, so far you might think that, okay, this is the same as uh, depth wise, but there's a big difference. The big difference is that at each node that we're making the split at each level, the features are the same, the splits are the same. So for example, here, if it is balance greater than hundred, here is also balance greater than hundred. So there's a big difference between this method and the depth wise method, right? So that's at each level, that each depth level of the tree, uh, the features and the split cutoff is exactly the same. 
All right, so these are the three different uh, methods for how we grow a tree. They have their own advantages and disadvantages, and this is exactly what makes the difference between the boosting methods. Now, let's finally answer the fourth fundamental question. How do we combine these trees? So remember, we decided what feature to start with, where to put the split, how, what is the splitting process, and after that, how do we grow a tree? And now finally, how do we combine these trees that we put together, right? So there are two general ways of doing this, namely bagging versus boosting. So, and let's look into them. So bagging, as the name suggests, it's bootstrap aggregation. So it consists of creating many copies of a training data. So imagine this is your training data and we're going to create multiple copies that are slightly different from each other because they have been bootstrapped with replacement, right? Then we're going to apply weak learner to each of these copies. So let's say this is my weak learner number one. I say it's a decision tree. Decision tree number one, decision tree number two, decision tree number three. Uh, remember, the weak learner can be any weak learner. It doesn't need to be uh, decision trees, but because decision trees are so powerful and uh, simple to work with, and they have very ma many actually advantages, uh, usually when we're doing bagging and boosting, the weak learner, one of the best weak learners out there is decision tree. But this does not mean that you cannot have your own weak learner. The idea is that then we're going to combine multiple of these weak learners to come up with a stronger learner at the end of the day. So here, our weak learner number one, decision tree one, is going to generate some output. Let's say y hat one. Number two, y hat two. Number three, y hat three, right? And then we are going to ensemble them or basically connect them together. If it is regression, we can simply weight them or take the mean. If it is classification, we can simply look at the majority vote and finally come up with a prediction. This is your final prediction. So that's the bagging in a nutshell. In bagging, the bootstrap trees are independent from each other. So it doesn't mean that they're coming from different data sets. They all come from one data set, but they're slightly different from each other. And the trees based on each of those uh, boosted observations are independent from each other. So that's the point. <clears throat> and it can be done in parallel for sure. If you have hundreds of trees, you can do it in parallel. And the second method is boosting. So boosting consists of using the original training data. So let's say we start from here. And we iteratively create multiple models by using the weak learner, right? So let's say we start from here. So this is the original data. We are going to apply the first weak learner, decision tree number one. Something, some part of the, the data is going to be explained by decision tree number one. We pass it to the output. Some part is not going to be explained. So we call it the residual of the decision tree number one, right? So this is going to be a new input. So let's say the residual one. Then we're going to apply our second decision tree to the residuals, right? To the part of the data which was not explained. Again, this model is going to be able to explain part of the output, right? Now actually, I'm going to say the output is going to be r hat one now, right? Because look at the input. You know, we had some inputs where we're predicting those residuals, right? And then this process is being done iteratively. We can go through thousands of trees, for example, using weak learners. And remember, each new model tries to fix the errors that comes from the previous model made, right? So at the end of the day, I can call it whatever. How do we, how do we connect these things? How do we ensemble? It's going to be a weighted average of all these outputs, right? We're going to connect them with a, the shrinkage method called lambda. So it's going to be lambda, the output of the first one, plus lambda, the output of the lambda to the power of two, the output of the second one, and etc. So this is how we aggregate. Okay. So in boosting, remember, each tree is grown using information from the previous tree. So in that sense, it's not like bagging that the trees themselves are independent from each other. So this tree is completely independent from this one. This is independent from this one. So here it's not the case. These are, they're connected through, let me try to show it to you, through this residual part. Okay, they're not independent completely from each other. Okay, so that was the idea of bagging versus boosting. Now we are ready to go to the next slide and start uh, by looking into the details of XGBoost, how it was developed, what was the motivation, 
cat boost and light gbm just be, be aware that i'm going to do these explanations at a very high level and without going into the details of the mathematical part of it if you're interested in the mathematics i encourage you to just uh, find the original paper and read the, the formulas from the original paper it should be straightforward ha having these uh, things in your mind you know these concepts how they're fundamentally different it should be at least easier to uh, read through the paper by your own now all right now let's uh, start with the xgboost and how xgboost was developed right so this is a very important slide in the sense that it puts together all the steps why we need to go beyond decision tree, why we need to go beyond bagging or even random forest. Because we will see that in general, as we go from left to right, the performance of the model is going to be, become better. Again, in general, not, it's not always the case, but in general, in many, in many applications, that's, that's the case. Okay. So let me actually remind you this graph. We're going to uh, base all of our conversation based on this graph. So this is our test error set. And I want you to think about a, a cross-validation error. So on the vertical axis, we have cross-validation error. On the horizontal axis, we have model complexity, right? So here, as we go from left to right, the model is going to become more complex, right? Now, we are focusing on decision trees. So what do we mean by model complexity? Let's assume we are looking at the depth of a tree, right? So here, this is the simplest tree out there. Let's just, it's a trunk, right? It basically, it's, it doesn't have any branches. It's a, it's a smallest tree with depth one. And now this might be the most complex, very bushy tree, right? So this is our setup. Let's start with decision trees. So how do we do in decision trees? We say that, okay, there are many good properties that decision trees have. They're simple, they're explainable. We like these trees. But the problem is that they are usually, especially if you make it a little bit bushy, they are usually not, um, they don't have a good performance, right? And the reason in the test, the reason is that we say, okay, let's start from a very bushy tree. Again, we are here in decision tree. Let's start from a very bushy tree. And when the, when the uh, tree is very large, we know that uh, the bias is going to be small because on average, we're going to hit the target. But the variance is going to be large. The model variance is going to be large. So combined together, this thing, the performance in the cross-validation set or the test set is going to be bad, right? So we know that the tree is overfitting and et cetera, right? How we fix that? If it is a single decision tree, we say, okay, start with the very bushy tree and then prune it back by method like, you know, uh, cost complexity pruning back method, right? Hopefully we can come up with the, let's say we use cost complexity pruning back, back method and we get to a point that uh, we get a good balance of uh, bias and variance in the model and hopefully we get a decent level of complexity for the model in a single decision tree, okay? The point is that even though we use cost complexity pruning method, we use a greedy approach, and uh, still the performance of the model is not necessarily good. So the point is that how can we make this performance even better? That's why the idea of let's ensembling these methods together come, come to place, right? So why not take advantage of the wisdom of the crowd? So let's combine a bunch of these decision trees and make one using bootstrap aggregation and see if we can perform better. So the idea is that, okay, still go ahead and start from a very bushy tree. Now, instead of pruning it back, let's combine a bunch of them together, right? And the hope is that when you're combining a bunch of them together, the model variance is going to reduce. Let me use the right color. The model variance for any level of complexity should reduce, right? When you're bagging. So this is a statistical property. When you're combining multiple models, the estimate, the variance of the estimate is going to decrease, right? So hopefully if you combine these two now, again, you should get a better performance, right? So that's the idea of bagging. And so usually the performance of the bagging is better than decision tree. So this is our number two. Now, then we decided to move on with random forest because the main question was that, can we do even better? And by doing even better is that, can we focus on the model variance even more? Is there any way we can reduce the model variance even uh, further down, right? So maybe make it something like this. The answer is yes. How do we do that? So this is a very subtle. I want you to pay attention. So this is our number three. We're looking at random first. So in a simple decision tree, when we're doing bagging, when you're putting all these uh, boot, you know, bootstrap trees together, let's say I have an original tree. Keep it very simple. And I want to generate, I don't know, thousands of these trees. Okay. 
if I'm doing bagging, and imagine there are, I don't know, very simple three features, you know, balance, income, and age. I have balance, income, and age, and I want to generate thousands of these features and then combine the output together, right? So if balance is the most important feature, so if the balance, imagine balance is super important for this problem, and no matter what you do, the first split is going to be always balanced, always balanced. So this means that when I'm creating the trees, almost all of those trees are going to pick the balance as the first split because that was the most important one. So these trees, these thousands of trees, when I'm doing bagging, they're going to be correlated to each other. The idea of random forest is that how can we decorrelate these trees, right? So decorrelate. So this is a key term, decorrelate decision trees in random forest. And the idea is very neat. And the fact is that at each split, when you're picking features, you know, at each split you have to decide among these three features, let's pick one, right? Random forest says that let's pick a subsample of these features, not necessarily all of them. If I have M features, let's pick square root of M. Let's pick log M of these features, right? So let's say if I have 10 features at each split, I'm going to pick four of them. At each split, I'm going to randomly select three of them. So this means that this mechanism allows a tree that starts with age instead of balance. Remember, if balance was the dominant one, we said that no matter what you do, every single tree is going to start with the balance. But we want to avoid this. We want to make sure that we come up with different trees, with different splits, with different features that it's at each split, which is not dominated by the most, by the most important feature. And this is the beauty of random forest. Random forest does that. And this process makes the trees more decorrelated. And the more decorrelated trees we have, the smaller model variance we get. So that's how the random forest is going to reduce the variance even further down compared to bagging, right? So this is the idea of decision tree, bagging, and random forest. Then the boostings are completely different, right? So let me go ahead and erase all this stuff. So the way that the boosting works is looking at this bias variance trade-off in a completely different angle. So the idea is that we don't need to start with the greedy algorithm. We don't need to go all the way down to a bushy tree or, or pruning, pruning it back or ensembling it. We start with a very, very simple and a small tree. Let's say we small with a trunk. Actually, in some of the boosting methods, you start with a trunk. Let's say we start from here. And if we start with a very small tree, let's say this is the model, the model variance is going to be super small, right? Because there is, again, the, uh, the, the model is not complicated and different samplings is not going to give you different answers. So most probably the model variance is going to be very small. But the problem is that on average, this model is not capturing anything. So the model bias is going to be so high. Okay. So the idea of boosting is that it focused on this bias part. Right? instead of focusing on the variance part, right? So how does it fix it? It changed the structure of the model. It do it in a sequential way. It says that, okay, at each step, fix part of the data and then pass it to the output. And then whatever is not explained, pass it to the next tree, right? And then the next tree, who knows, maybe the next tree is working on the residuals. Maybe some other features may, is gonna show up, right? So this is, it's going to attack the bias term and hopefully reduce the bias for different levels of complexity, and the combination is going to come down, right? So this is how boosting is handling this problem of uh, uh, test set error versus model complexity. Again, this is a very unique uh, technique as well. All of these techniques are fascinating when you, when you think about them, right? And then the next one, which is even more interesting, is gradient boosting. So the way that the gradient boosting works is that it's going to say that, okay, now not all the observations in the data are equally weighted. Why should it be equally weighted? Let's weight them differently. And what weighting mechanism is better than if you weight them based on their gradient, inverse of their gradient, right? If the gradient is high, give more attention to them. Not, uh, sorry, uh, relevant to their gradient, right? The higher gradient means that that data set, that sample has not been uh, trained well, so we need to focus more on them. If the gradient of the cost function is small for an observation, it has been trained well, so we can pay less attention to that. So these are the gradient-based based models. And then the difference between gradient boosting and XGBoost is that 
XGBoost is simply an extension to gradient boosting and focus on some parallel processing and some other features that I'm going to talk about in the next slide. But the idea is that these boosting mechanisms, because they are doing sequentially, they are not necessarily parallelizable, but uh, people figured out how can they make it work in parallel. So that's the idea of XGBoost, focusing on the, on the speed and performance when it comes to boosting trees. All right, now let's look into these XGBoost, and CatBoost, and LightGBM libraries. So XGBoost is an open source gradient boosting library. It was developed back in 2014 by Tian Kichan and its group, his group. It, it focuses on developing efficient and scalable machine learning algorithm, right? So the extreme refers to the fact that the algorithm and its method have been used, customized to push the limit of what is possible for gradient boosting algorithms, right? So it's focusing on the speed part, parallelization. Um, because the performance of GBM is good, you know, it's uh, it's making um, the speed part more um, emphasized. Uh, so XGBoost includes several other features that can improve model performance, and such. A, and these are the features that uh, that's included in the XGBoost: handling missing values, automatic feature selection, and model ensembling. Right. So remember these. Actually, this part is common among the three boosting algorithms that we investigate among the XGBoost, CatBoost, and LightGBM. All of them are have their own method for handling missing values. They do automatic feature selection, and they have their own way of ensembling models, right? So what makes XGBoost very fascinating, it can be summarized in this nice chart, right? So I'm going to start from the uh, bottom right. So it has this in um, your built-in cross-validation capability. So it basically it's gonna uh, this the XGBoost avoid overfitting at each boosted trees. So this helps to avoid overfitting at each boosted trees, and the cross-validation is done automatically, right? So this this is a big deal. So at each boosted tree, imagine we have thousands of these trees. At each tree, cross-validation is done automatically. The second one, it's the efficient handling uh, way of handling missing data, right? So to reduce the data sparsity, remember this the idea of curse of dimensionality. When the dimension of the data is large, we know that uh, we get data sparsity, right? There are some parts of the data that there is it's not enough representative when it comes to the making prediction in the model, right? It's not enough informative. So we, we are dealing with data sparsity. And uh, XGBoost automatically and efficiently handle those missing data. Okay, so that, that's an important thing. The other one that makes XGBoost very the, the interesting is the regularization on top of regular uh, regularizations that we have in decision trees, right? So on top of regularizations like, for example, max depth or cost complexity pruning or max terminal nodes and etc., XGBoost do another layer of regularization, and it's done by adding this penalty term to the loss function. So it's penalizing the loss function by adding the basically a regularized weights of the terminal nodes, observations in the terminal nodes, right? And those can be added using L1 norm or L2 norm, right? So the idea is that uh, let's add those, uh, for example, weights at the terminal nodes in a way that we do, for example, those weights to the power of two. This is L2 norm. Well, we do we can ignore this. So this is L2 norm. We can have add this one to the loss function or L1 norm, the absolute value of those weights to the loss function, right? So this is this makes the, the gradient X, XGBoost very appealing. And sometimes because of this, uh, XGBoost is called regularized boosting technique as well. So the next one is cache awareness and this idea of out of core computing. So we know that um, CPU computation basically is fastest on cache memory, then on the main memory, and then on the hard drive. So XGBoost runs the gradient calculation in the cache memory. So that's the advantage of that, right? So this idea of out-of-core computing is an optimization that takes the computer hardware into account, right? Instead of reading data, or sometimes very large data, from the hard drive, which is a slow, it will decompose the data <clears throat> from hard drive and then use that cache memory for calculation. This decomposition is going to take a little time, but it is worth it because the rest of the calculation is done on the cache memory and super fast. And this is what makes the XGBoost blazingly faster than GBM. Then, then the other property is this tree pruning uh, method, which is basically it's using depth first, uh, depth first approach, right? So we know that in GBM, uh, 
the algorithm would stop splitting a node when it encounters a negative loss, right? So when the algorithm get a neg, because we said that it's it's a greedy one, right? Uh, however, and for that reason, it is more of a greedy algorithm, the GBM. However, the XGBoost, on the other hand, makes splits up to maximum depth, and then start pruning the trees backward and remove the splits beyond which there is no positive gain, right? So we, we can connect this one to our splitting method of leafwise, if you wish. It goes all the way down, and so that's why we say depth first, all, all the way down, and then the prune it back from there, okay? And the last one is this idea of parallelization, uh, which again, the, remember these boosting algorithms are sequential, and it's hard to parallelize them, but if we somehow manage to parallelize this uh, calculation, it's gonna be a lot faster than the GBM. Okay, our next boosting algorithm is LightGBM. LightGBM, again, is another open source gradient boosting library. It was developed by Microsoft back in 2016. It is fast and efficient, and it's specifically used for large-scale learning tasks. So this is what makes it powerful. And on top of that, it can handle categorical features better than XGBoost, but still it requires some one-hot encoding, ordinal encoding, or any other pre-processing the data. So uh, the advantage of CATS Boost over LightGBM is that it's even better than LightGBM when it comes to handling categorical features. Just like XGBoost, uh, LightGBM also includes several other features that can improve model performance, and the features are handling missing values, automatic feature selection, and model ensemble. And the last one is CatBoost. So CatBoost stands for category boosting, and as the name suggests, it should be good at handling categorical variables. Actually, it was designed to handle categorical variables better than XGBoost and LightGBM, right? Without doing any pre-processing, without doing one-hot encoding. So CatBoost is an open source, again, another open source gradient boosting library. It was developed by Yandex back in 2017. And again, it is specifically designed for handling uh, categorical data. Uh, it can handle categorical features directly. So this is a key term. It directly does that without the need of one-hot encoding or any other sort of pre-processing. Just like XGBoost and LightGBM, again, it focuses on model performance and by basically allowing handling missing values, automatic feature selection, and model ensemble. So this is a common feature between the three models. Remember, all these three models are very strong you know, when it comes to performance uh, and handling structured data. Now, in the very last slide, I want to summarize the differences between these three models that you at the high level, at least you should know, when you're doing, for example, pie carrot and running a horse race between these models, you should know what's the difference between them. If you have a model with so many categorical features and uh, so many categorical features with the strings actually, with, with names, so that would be that maybe CatBoost is going to be a better one, right? If you have a large scale data model uh, data sets, then maybe LightGBM is the best, right? So, but usually these three are among the top winners when it comes to Kaggle competitions. All right, here's the last slide that uh, I tried to summarize the differences between XGBoost versus LightGBM and CatBoost. Just pay attention that this is as of today, right? Maybe as of 2023. And I'm quite sure that the developers of these packages are thinking all constantly on improving the, the, you know, these algorithms for sure. So by the time that you're watching this video, I don't know, maybe in a couple of years, all of them have com has converged in terms of handling categorical variables and things like that. Just to just keep in mind that these things, the differences that you see is a standing as of today, at least as far as I know, okay? So starting with the developer. So for XGBoost, as we said, it was developed. It actually was part of Chen's PhD research. You know, he was focusing on developing efficient and scalable machine learning. And uh, when, uh, when Shenz was finishing his PhD at the University of Washington. LightGBM, a couple of, year, couple of years later, uh, was developed by Microsoft and CatBoost a year later by Yandex. You know, Yandex is the yeah, Russian multinational tech company uh, that they do some internet related products and services, okay? The base model, the weak learner in, in all of these things is decision tree, because again, we love the properties of decision trees, how powerful they are, 
how simple to understand they are when it comes to the weak learner. And the idea is that let's boost a bunch of or thousands of these decision trees and make it better. The growing algorithm, remember the four questions, well, what feature to start with, where to put the split, what is the splitting process, what is the growing tree process, and how to ensemble them. So this is what makes these three models different. In terms of ensembling, they're all using boosting, right? But in, the, in terms of answering the first three questions, they're different. So for example, one is here, tree growing algorithm. In XGBoost, it is depth-wise, uh, but I've seen that uh, leaf-wise is also available. So when it was originally, I think proposed only was depth wise, but the leaf wise was added. So this is what I mean, right? So all these algorithms would, are going to improve over time. And light GBM is doing leaf wise uh, tree growth and cat boost is doing symmetric in, in tree growth, right? Then in terms of parallel processing, XGBoost can do single G GPU, uh, light GBM and cat boost can do multiple GBM. G GPU, sorry, GPUs. So that's why it's going to be slightly faster, depending on, on the uh, um, size of the data. Light GBM and cat boost are going to be faster than XGBoost. Actually, light GBM is the most uh, scalable one among the three. Uh, in terms of handling categorical features, of course, XGBoost is worse among the three and because it, it requires the encoding, uh, either one-hot encoding, ordinal encoding, tar target encoding, label encoding for uh, variables with the uh, text. Uh, this process is done automatically in light GBM, but still the encoding is needed, right? So it's, it is needed, but it's done automatically. In cat boots, it's not even needed, right? So there's no encoding required. So it's all, so again, that's where the name's coming from, categorical boosting. And uh, finally, the difference in terms of splitting is, you know, in XGBoost, again, as far as I know, it's pre-sorted and histogram-based. And uh, light GBM is using GOSS, gradient-based, one-sided sampling, and cat boost is using a greedy method. So this is the difference between these three um, boosting algorithms at a very high level. So, <clears throat> Hopefully now when you're calling these uh, models or packages from a library like PyCarrot, you have a slight idea of what is happening under the hood and you know, what is the difference between these algorithms. Because in terms of performance, they're all good. You know, usually they are line up right after each other when you're applying it to any sort of data sets. And uh, maybe my only advice is that if you have a very, if you have a data set with with a very high dimensional and lots of the categorical variables, maybe try cat boost first. But in terms of computation, honestly, it's 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 no big difference. You can simply let them run using a PyCarrot package and uh, use GPUs and give it more power and then compare the performance. All right, uh, I hope that was useful. Until the next one, take care.